Well, hey there, Stephen. How are you doing today? I am blessed and glad to be here. It seems like forever since we did our last one. I know. Yeah, we've had kind of a, a long stretch where you and I have been together. Now, you know, the the listeners and the viewers don't necessarily know no, that that's because right. you know, we knock out a handful when we get together. So oh, there there's a go. little bit of a rhythm on the actual and then releasing of the there's podcast. There's fillers between. Sure, you yeah, know? Yeah. I hear there are all these guests, and I look at who's talking now. We have lots about of great what? guests. Yeah. Yep. Well, so today, Stephen, we're going to kind of talk. Uh, really to the the women in our audience yes um but in some ways we're going to talk about how can we help women maybe understand certain aspects of men is that fair to say like like yes. certain and and some of these ideas come from this book that uh, shanti feld feldhan i can never know i, I never know how to pronounce I think her that's last right. name mm-hmm. uh, called through a man's eyes helping women understand the visual nature of men and so you you grabbed a few ideas out of here. Um, do, and you then, ever, do you ever lift up the book and say, yeah, here's for, what it looks for like? Our, uh, for yeah. our viewers, you can Good. see that's the book right Good. there. So. so I just talked to a lot of people, and somebody says, hey, I read this book, and it's good, and I make a note. If, it, if I want to, I ordered it. I have all these books I'm always trying to read through. And it's funny how I used to be a real slow reader. Now I'm just skimming better and trying to get the heart of the material but this lady is a researcher, and she's written several books. She wrote another one, uh, For Women Only, I think mm-hmm. is what it's called. And she's trying to help women understand men and what's going on with men. And, and it, you know, there's an emphasis in this on sexuality <clears throat> and how men are wired. And, you know, we all know this. It's like men have a code. Just keep it to yourself, okay? Only tell a brother. If you tell the women, you'll scare them. So, okay, don't tell them, all right? Yeah. Well, sometimes it's not even just, you know, if you tell the women, you'll scare them. Sometimes, and I don't mean to sound, you know, rude here, but sometimes we have thought if you tell the women, then everybody will know. Because uh, there can be kind of a, not to kind of a communication women. hotline that happens, you know. <laughs> so when now you the women. list is two. <laughs> You're going to scare them. They're not going to understand. Three, it gets out. Yeah. And when it comes out, it's out, right? Stuff that's in is in, and this stuff gets out. That's good. So the whole idea that, that men and women are different, and, you know, we live in a culture that's going, oh, men are women, and women are men, and there's no difference. And it's like... Okay, maybe maybe this is an old guy's view. I don't know, because sexuality is is being seen very differently, and you and I are kind of old school. So, so I'm still talking about uh, you, you scare the wives. And and one guy said to me, the women are becoming as crazy as the men now. The young women are as crazy. Okay, that's another issue. But but yeah. I remember a couple of old guys in relationships are saying, well, what do you do with your sexuality? It's hard to manage male sexuality. I think everybody knows that. And I don't think I don't think it's at all unfair or, or not right to talk about the reality that differences exist. I mean, we can yes. we can deny them mm-hmm. all we want, but. You know, there is an ontological nature to the differences between male and female. And um, I think there need to be voices that continue to express that in a in a coherent, logical, rational way. Mm. That, so that because I think sometimes right now there's such a kind of a, uh, these high pitched arguments that just screaming sessions about mm-hmm. who's wrong and and how much I hate your views and all this kind of stuff that we we can't have dialogue anymore we can't have conversations and we can't step and back and say yeah. now any of us that even if you go on to like uh, one of my favorite sort of anecdotal research environments for this is um, go to a place where little kids are together four, five, six-year-old kids. My wife is a first-grade teacher. Okay. So she's got a room full of 26-year-olds. Okay. Let me tell you, there are differences between (laughs) boys and girls. I don't care what you – I don't care the propaganda that you are Mm. are throwing into them. I don't care. It's like there are just natural differences to boys and girls in terms of how they behave, how they think, how they process. So How they play. And we're, we're really going to be talking kind of mainly about one particular area, right? the idea of the visual nature of men or yes yes 
So that's the title of the book, Through a Man's Eyes. So she makes this premise, God created men to be more visual. I think we've already sort of said that and know that, but but the whole idea that God made men a certain way, and he didn't make men like women, he made men like men, for whatever reason he made men like he made men, for his purposes. He, she says the men's brains are physically different from the female brain. Mm-hmm. So this isn't a hard science, brain study kind of uh, talk, but there's some key points. She says there's the chemistry is dis- different, the hormones, right? The estrogen and the testosterone, all the hormones are mixed different. And so th- there's a different function that happens in the body. And she comes back to men are more visual. Uh, scientists have found that much more of the male brain is set aside for the visual processing of information. That the, there's a part of the brain that's larger connected to the visual than in the female brain. So um, one, re- one researcher said the male brain and female brains are so different, they look like two different species. So, I don't know, how's that striking you? She's making some broad statements here. We sort of know this. I think what ends up happening is, I, I, I don't think there's anybody that would, for one thing, there is abs, there's actually, there is research that, I mean, you can look at brain scans, you can look at, uh, like she's talking about the hormone mix, and it's like, you can't deny, okay, there, there's just, there's a difference, there's biological differences here. Yeah. I think, where sometimes we struggle is again we're in a we're in a time in our history especially in the western world right now where we are trying to erase all distinctions mm. in an ironic way by allowing there to be whatever distinction you want to make so in other words it's like t- take gender for instance we're trying to erase gender by saying choose your own there can be a thousand choices and it's so we're we're eliminating the idea that there could be differences by mm. actually allowing for there to be an innumerable amount of differences. And so what that does, at the very least, it creates all this confusion. Right. And then we're just basically saying there's there's zero difference, even though you could look again at two different brain scans, one one a male and one a female, and say that's not the same. Here's where I think mm. we have. Um, I think how people interpret this information is where we get into trouble. So for instance, when somebody when you say, "Hey, you know what this shows biologically that men just tend to be more geared towards responding visually in the world and in their surroundings." Yeah. And unfortunately, what I think that has meant even in the Christian community is that we have assumed that because men have misused that natural visual urge to take advantage of others through pornography or rape or other kinds mm. of things that that then we say therefore fundamentally the visual coding is wrong mm. like the fact that you're more visual the fact that these things are biologically uh you know part of your system that's inherently evil or Bad, inherently yeah. wrong that you're more mm-hmm. visual than females is, is that making sense yeah. or what do you think yeah yeah. Well, let me keep going down this little list here, and you throw some ideas, and I will. And we're just we're we're really trying to to reflect her thoughts and our thoughts about men. And the, you know, if you train a man right, he manages himself well. So that if you told your son, you, you you're going to have a visual mm-hmm. nature to you, a bent to you. Let, let's just realize that. Then I think you're going to help him versus. You know, you're odd, you're different, you're a pig, what's the matter with you? So so let me go on here. The female brain is wired for emotion and verbal processing. Those are larger. And she says the, the male is has a visual part that's larger. And the chemicals between the two different brains create different responses. So th- listen to this statement. I thought this was interesting. A man's first look is automatic and purely biological. Then he has a choice of what he's going to do next. Mm -hmm. Women will say, why'd you look? You know, well, why'd you do that? I I knew what you did. You looked. Why'd you look? Don't you know? Don't look. 
she says there's something wired in a man when, and I'll, you know, I'll go in and out what I think, what she thinks, but if someone pretty, someone beautiful comes in, that a guy will look. And she says that's hardwired in, it's automatic, and it's biological. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens next is different. Yeah. But there's a bent, there's a, an automatic, there's a biological. And I can tell some of the women out there are starting to fidget. Oh, yeah. We've probably already lost <laughs> half of the listeners because, you know, I think I think they're probably most curious, like, okay, yeah, w what are you going to say next? Because are you then going to say, okay, um, is that creating this sense of I, I get a total pass to, you know, ogle a woman? Yeah. And, and so, you know, and we've talked about this even before on the podcast sometimes about um, – uh, you know, the old saying, you look too long, you look wrong. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's so, a good one. You look too long, you look wrong. So we also have to think about it in terms of our 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 male audience and say, listen, let's be honest also about how our hearts can be deceitful. Mm -hmm. And we can fool ourselves and we can play mind tricks with <laughs> ourselves. So, so a guy might hear this and say, hey, it's biological. But he might play with that in an immoral way. Right. In a sense that says, now I'm going to use that as an excuse to do something that is not right in what what it's said here about what you do next. Yes. So, um, but I think it's important. I think it's important to just pause for a second and say, and ask ourselves, is it okay that God made men this way? Mm. And I know that even that can create a sense of discomfort, especially if men and women in our audience, if they've been so... Um, tied into a certain narrative, a certain way of thinking mm -hmm. that um, a man's eyes should should work or the way a man should use his eyes. And keep in mind, I know that we've got tons of examples in which men have misused that right. visual aspect. Yep. But I think we've got we've got to be able to separate the misuse, from just the design in which how God built our brains and built our bodies and built our eyes. Yes. And is it okay that men are more visual? Is it okay that there is a sort of, as she's putting it here, like an automatic biological response that doesn't at that point have any kind of moral ramifications, Right. but we know that there is a millisecond there in which we now have to engage other parts of our system to say, what am I going to do next right, that's in order it. to actually manage my body and my mind well? So what I love about reading this book, and she says, every time I try to teach women how men are different and there's this biological automatic thing that happens, after every talk, one or two women come and attack me. <laughs> What are you doing? Are you giving them permission? Right. Why are you saying this? No, it's bad. It's wrong. Don't you? And she says, I have to protect myself because some women go, okay, I want to learn how men are. I got to be smart. Uh, and if there's some things we can know that will make us more successful, okay. I just laughed and hooted because that, that takes us into this arena of how do men engage women sexually in dialogue with, with who they are? We live in a culture that's sick. It's, it's sick and it sells pornography and sexuality and distortions and lies. And, and, and it's like the traditional response is just stop. Just stop. Mm -hmm. You know, don't be that. Be something else. Stop. A, a guy goes, I can't, you know, I'm kind of wired this way. I'm, I have a little battle going on in here and I need to talk. So that when this national speaker goes around and she gets attacked for one little piece of information, you know, it's not very encouraging right. for men to go, hey, I want to go home and talk about this stuff. It's a bit of a battle. So I think that's part of what our discussion today about is how well do you handle his sexuality and his struggles and his desire to kind of bring some of the battle to you? Because... I'll tell you, this is such a, it'll trigger in a female mm -hmm. some of her worst fears. So 
I'm going to go down. Are you telling me that it's okay for men to look like this? Are, are you saying to me that men can be out of control? I've always thought they're just pigs. Is it, are you giving them permission to be pigs? You know, how can I ever trust a guy if he's, if I find out he's sloppy in his head? How, how can I ever trust him? And one said, uh, I'll never see my husband the same again after what you just told me. It's like, oh, God, I wish we hadn't told you or something. <laughs> what are you thinking? Well, I think it's, um, I think the only way that we learn and grow is by continuing to explore what is true, what is right, what is good, what is beautiful. You know, we need to keep pursuing those things. And what we're talking about here is we're bringing some some truth about the biological design, the the hardwiring that is in men um, that might create some struggle, not only just for the, the women in mm-hmm. these men's lives, but I think for the men too, because... On one hand, on the one hand, I think there can be a collective, uh, a little bit of a collective sigh of relief for the men, where they realize, okay, so so what you're telling me is not everything about how I am wired visually is automatically wrong. Right. Even That's though good. you know what, if I'm honest, I haven't managed my eyes as well as I should have as as a image bearer of God. Mm. But just being able to say, okay. What, what would it look like now for this man to learn to live in a way of really stewarding that well, mm. and, and then for a, a wife or a, a, a woman in this man's life to be able to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to realize that there are aspects to how he's wired that are different from me, and that doesn't automatically mean because they're different, they're wrong. By the way, that's something that my, my parents told me over and over again growing mm. up just to learn how to actually have interactions with people that are not like you, people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different experiences, different families, is they would say, listen, different doesn't automatically mean wrong. So when you when yeah. you are interacting with somebody and you realize this person doesn't think the way I do, they don't right. respond the way I do, they're not, they don't have the same experiences. That's good. And so I think sometimes what ends up happening is because like we said, like like you said before, women are wired for more verbal and processing and emotional processing. Mm. That when she learns that he's he's uh, he responds first visually because that's not like her. She's like that's wrong. No, you know what I mean. Sometimes yeah. we can interpret the yes, differences yes, as yes. automatically being wrong. And so I think there's there's room for growth on both sides of this. Right. There's room for growth for the woman and for the man. Right, because I think, you know, I'm, it's going to sound funny, but I'm big on fear. So I think fear drives a lot of us. And I don't think we're aware of it. But I think when we get into sexuality, her fear comes up. Oh, yeah. Right? Because some of the statements um, go on to say, what do I do with this thought? that he's tempted to look at another woman. Mm. Well, what do I do with that thought? It scares me, it overwhelms me. I don't like it. Why, why can't he just look at me? Mm. He's gonna look at somebody else and that's gonna trigger some of her fears. And if she's not careful, she's gonna lash out instead of be wise and manage that fear. Some people start to be the policeman and go, okay, I'm gonna watch you now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to every time your eyes, I'm gonna call you out on your eyes. And I'm gonna help you with your eyes. And it's like, yeah, I'm glad you're smiling because it's like, what are you doing? You're killing me and killing us and killing the joy. Well, you know? and also just, uh, I think it's a natural part of our humanity to essentially, especially when we get into these deep, intimate relationships like a marriage, mm-hmm. where we are, <clears throat> I mean, I've been married long enough now where I know that this ship sailed a long time ago, but the idea of trying to sort of reform your spouse into your own image, and then you realize... That's how we start, right? That's how you start. <laughs> You're kind of like, I, I, don't worry, I'll convince this person to think the way I do, see life the way I do, you know, respond to things the way I do. I'll, I'll convince them to like the things <laughs> that I like. I, I'll, I'll, I'll fix them. Yeah. <laughs> and both of us do that, Right. And I think there's a point at which you have to realize, no, wait a second, there's, there's a reason for those differences and mm-hmm. they create, a, they, create um, they complement one another. And if those differences go away, for, for one thing, if my wife 
if I was successful in turning my wife into me, now she's redundant. Yeah, I have two me's. Same thing, if she turned me into her. So again, kind of stepping back and saying, can we first and foremost not only just acknowledge the differences of how we are wired to respond mm-hmm. to stimuli, but can we also uh, seek to try to to press in to learn about that in the other person rather yes. than just either dismissing it or calling it wrong or saying, like you said, I'm going to help you with your eyes. I'll fix you. I'll, you know, I'll make sure that you see life the way I do. And instead, I think we need to press in. And I, I think for husbands, you know what? They need to say, I need to understand more about that whole emotional, verbal processing thing. Not to say that he's going to be able to do it the way his wife does, right. but maybe she also needs to say, I, I need to understand more about what it's like to see literally see the world through your eyes in terms of the way that, you know, just things can catch your gaze. And by the way, I will say this, this idea of being visually stimulated, Mm -hmm. this is not exclusive to sex. I think overall, men are more visually oriented. So now I think the most, the thing that's going to grab our visual attention the quickest is going to be anything related but to sexuality. But give me another example. They're going to get caught up in like looking at whatever a football game and and so into it they're not listening. What, what That's ex- that was be? exactly the example I was going to bring up. Um, think of how how quickly and easily men typically, especially if they're into sports or any kind of particular mm-hmm. kind of entertainment or let's say gaming, how quickly can they get like zoned out? Yeah. Where there's just there's tunnel vision. And when you think about that in terms of a general difference with a lot of times a female, is it not true that in some ways her attention can kind of be divided among oh, multiple things, right? I can be cooking dinner and talking to the kids and deal yes, with this. Yes. And what happens? He's sitting in front of the television or he's got a newspaper, or he's got his you know yeah. game on his phone or whatever, and the world is dead to him hmm. because he's visually locked in to whatever that is. So, so okay, let's pull back. We're going in and out on different topics here, but we hope that we're at least uh, prompting some thoughts that will create some dialogue. So a lot of women, their fear will come up. And it's like, is he rejecting me? Does he not want me? And then, then all her pain of rejection and fear and abandonment rises up. And now he was trying to have a little conversation. Now all of her pain is coming. So that's going to be a problem. Right, she's going to have to check herself. If we're going to have this dialogue, she's going to have to own her fears, recognize her fear, talk to God about her fears, because he, sexuality is probably going to trigger some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, it's it's interesting because in the middle of this book, they uh, bring in a, a pastor, Ted Cum- Cunningham. Uh, they said he does a radio show and he loves marriage, and he wrote a book himself on the fun of marriage. And he said, men need a safe place to talk. And they'd like to talk to their wives, but they need a safe place. And you and I have had this experience. People say men don't like to talk. No, men don't like to talk if it's not safe. That's exactly right, yeah. Because you you come to our groups, every guy talks, everybody's talking. They got a lot of things to say because By the end of the weekend, we can't shut them up. You know, it's like, because like you said, they finally realize it's safe to talk about things I've never been able to talk about anywhere else. So Cunningham says, we had to go through a very difficult season, my wife and I, of talking. And we had to talk about hard topics. And we decided that nothing was off limits. Mm. Um, and that the goal was try to try to understand each other, not punish, not vent our pain, not get put out with, and not turn away from. Can we try to understand each other? We're very different. And he said it was an amazing experience that created a oneness that we never had before, Mm -hmm. an intimacy of connection, and a new deeper relationship. Yeah. So think about this principle, because I think it's really true. When you talk to your spouse about stuff that's hard, and you they help you process it out, or you process their stuff out, it creates a new depth, a new skill. We go to a new place. And you think about a lot of relationships where she's over in her corner, he's in his, she talks to her friends, he talks to his, there are conversations between each other. They're not safe. Mm-hmm. 
Jesus. Yeah, I love what he's saying here about getting to a place where nothing's off limits and it's really about understanding each other. Um, when you can kind of move beyond that idea of I'm trying to repair or fix my spouse, I think you can start to to see things from a from a different perspective. And I think so many times what we're doing, especially around this issue of the visual nature of men, mm-hmm. is I think because that can be so triggering in a wife, mm-hmm. um, because she can she can kind of see where that could lead. That could yeah. lead to sin. That could lead to porn. That could lead right. to all kinds of what other things. What are you things. saying? To me? And so, because it's hard to separate that, sometimes we just lump it all together and say it's all a moral thing. Your your visual nature and bad if moral we, and bad. If we can Mor- instead step back and say, okay, this is part of the way you are designed. There's right. a visual aspect. I'd like to understand that more. Tell me kind of how you, how that works for you in your life. Not not just assuming that. Everything that a man ever does with his eyes is sloppy and sinful and all of that. So I think if there can be that leaning in to understand, and then like you said, also trying to create a safe enough space where if there are things that need to be discussed where a husband needs to say, I have mismanaged my eyes, and here's what I'm doing about it. This is the help that I'm getting, that that it's not a like a fatal... Right. It's like fatal to the Dramatic. relationship. Right. So so I'm going to say one more thing, and then I want you to close with the two things we talked about earlier. So that, why are we talking about this? Because a man told me this week, I have to lie to my wife. I have to protect her. I don't want her to think that I struggle, because she doesn't see me as a struggler. And if I open up, you know, will will she reject me? Will I scare her for who I am? I want to be whole. I want to be known. I want a safe place. I need to be vulnerable. Now, we know men do that well with men. But to some degree, part of our growth is to go to places we haven't gone and to say things we haven't said as, as we keep learning and growing. So she, he said, she knows a lot about me, and I know she loves me. But still, I have to hide part of me. I have to lie and pretend I'm not a part of who I am because it's just better to protect her. Mm -hmm. So this is one man's strategy. I don't think it's a great strategy, but I truly understand it. And not everybody's in the same place. Not everybody's totally healthy. So so what are two things that, that you would close us out with? Well, you had mentioned about um, a, a, a wife of a man who'd come to one of our workshops and she had a really, uh, an amazingly healthy response to this where she was able to, as, as this man's unpacking his story of brokenness and history and all the wounds and all that kind of stuff that she was able to, to say to him, I am sorry that you hurt you. Yeah. Like I, she was a, able to express. It's like she saw his brokenness. She yes. saw his pain, and was actually um, sorry. And she for, stayed for out. That. She didn't go inside her. Stuff. She didn't make it about herself in right. that moment. Even though we're not saying it didn't have any impact on her, but what she was able to do was say, "I can see how the during the, the the wounds and the pain and the trauma and the poor choices and the path that you've hurt you and yeah. and, and that." And and also allowing them for him to own it and be responsible for the So the think journey. about that line. We're repeating it because in the moment it was so powerful. We it just sucked the air right out of the room. I'm sorry for what you've done to you by mismanaging your eyes and doing the next thing and the next thing. She didn't say, Oh, what you did to me She said, Oh my goodness, you know, God is helping me be calm right now. And I can see what you've done to you, and you've messed up your life. I haven't messed mine up, but you've really messed up your life. And I'm so sorry mm-hmm. you messed up your own life. I thought that was powerful. Yeah, and then one other thing is, you know, just the way my own wife responded um, when we were going through our, our healing process. And one of the things that she had said to me that, or when she was also able to start to kind of see into my um, pain. She had she said something that just shocked her. She was like she couldn't believe how much I, in my shame, hmm. would had had just really doubted the love of God, the presence of God, the faithfulness hmm. of God, 
because that was so foreign to her. So, but but because she knew that so well. Yeah, because saying? that was not her experience. So what she was able to do was she was able to enter into kind of an an empathetic, compassionate space with me, to where she thought, "I'm sorry mm. that you." We're talking about visual, right? That you can't see the mm. love of God. That you can't see that He's faithful. That you can't see. So she was. She was. And saying, you don't I'm know so it. Sorry that you. Yeah. And you don't live it. I'm yeah. so sorry. And so I think there's something powerful again about about being able to separate yourself. Yes. From. Again, we're talking about differences, right? Right. It's okay to say I don't have that experience. I can't understand that. But I'm so sorry. That you yeah. have experienced that. I'm so sorry that you hurt you. I'm so sorry that you can't see the love of God. And, and you're still a child of God, and you're a good thing. You're made in the image of God. And and I'm just, I can sit here in the moment as you tell the story of pain, because anybody talking about sexual struggles is not going to be celebrating. They're going to be confessing. Mm-hmm. And for you to be Jesus in that moment and say, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. I'm sorry. That, that, that's got to be a lot to carry. That's got to be a lot of stupid and confusion and pain. And, you know, thanks for venting it. Bring it to the light. Well, we hope this conversation has at least maybe stirred some thoughts in you, maybe even uh, been uh, helpful for getting you having more deep conversations in your own relationship. But we are always glad that you're with us. Thanks for being here, and we we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. God bless. 